JavaScript changes constantly. So I asked on Twitter, what are some of the things that you used to do in JavaScript that you no longer do? So in this video, we'll look at 10 things that JavaScript developers have stopped doing. What's up, everyone? My name is James Q. Quick, and I do weekly videos about web development related topics. And in this one, we're going to talk about things that JavaScript developers no longer do. I was just kind of curious what JavaScript developers think has changed in the, in the JavaScript ecosystem or more specifically how they write code in the last several years. So I asked this on Twitter and I got some really good, uh, really good responses that we're going to walk through 10 examples of things that people said they no longer do. Now, keep in mind, this video is not to judge yourself. It's not to judge other people. People have different preferences, which is fine. If you have preferences on things that we talk about in this video, share them in the comments below. I'd love to have that conversation. But with that said, let's go ahead and get into the list of top 10 things that JavaScript developers no longer do. We'll start off with a big one here. Number one is JavaScript developers have stopped writing JavaScript. What does that mean? Well, it means that they're using TypeScript a lot. Now, TypeScript is a fairly divisive topic, but what TypeScript is, it's a superset of JavaScript that adds strong typing. So if you're used to a language like C Sharp or Java or other uh, strongly typed languages, you may be more familiar with what this is. But in TypeScript, you can define types for your different pieces of data. And because of that, you get some extra IntelliSense in your code. You also get to catch some errors before you ship it to production that you might not have caught before. Now, TypeScript has grown infinitely. Almost every framework now, when you set up a new project, has a flag that you can pass to initialize it to work with TypeScript. I personally have been working with TypeScript recently in uh, Next.js and in Svelte, and I am loving it more and more. In fact, I'll probably do a video, a follow-up video for this of like the top five reasons why I love using TypeScript. But just know this is a preference. If you prefer to use regular JavaScript, that's totally fine. There's no judgment here. There are some extra benefits with TypeScript that are really kind of hard to argue with, but it is a little cumbersome to set up. Some of the tooling is not quite there for ease of use, although in a lot of cases it is. So my recommendation is give TypeScript a try. Give it a fair shot. If you like it, stick with it. I bet your team will like it too. And if you don't like it, no worries, go back to it. But more and more people are moving away from vanilla JavaScript and moving to TypeScript. All right, number two here is writing for loops. Now this is kind of an interesting one because this is basically the basics of programming, right? Like this is one of the first things that you learn how to do, but we've got better ways to do this now. So I've got an example and these will be all simple examples for the stuff that we'll talk about. Uh, but this is uh, an array of names. This is uh, myself, uh, my wife, and then uh, our two dogs. And I've got a for loop that's going to go through and just print out these names. And I've got this uh, saved to uh, auto reload in the browser so you can see those printed out. That's fine. Uh, for loops are just really tedious to be quite honest. It really is no fun to write them. All of this stuff is kind of hard to understand and tedious to write. So we have a lot of built-in functions for arrays. So we have something like uh, names for each, and then for each name, uh, what do we want to do? Well, we can do a console log in here of the name. So this will accomplish the same result. All right, so there that is. And then uh, we can also even shorten this a little bit. We'll talk about arrow functions in a second. But we can do what's called an implicit return where we get rid of the brackets, get rid of the semicolon, get rid of that, and then have this all on one line. Now, you may or may not want that. A lot of times, these are actually pretty nifty uh, one-liners that you can do with arrays. Uh, so you can see this still does the same thing. This syntax to me is a lot cleaner, especially as you become comfortable with JavaScript array functions. I've got a series on that that you can check out for map, reduce, filter, et cetera. So go and check that out. But less and less do I actually write regular for loops myself and less and less do I see for loops in other people's code as well. These array functions are really changing the way that we do iterations of arrays. So check out all of the array functions that are available to you and see if you can incorporate them into your regular workflow. All right, so we kind of touched on this, that this is an arrow function, and this is something that I think is becoming more and more popular as well. In fact, I write all of my functions as arrow functions, but what is the difference between the two? Well, there's a few different things. In this case, I've got a basic definition of a function add, uh, which takes in two parameters and returns it, and then we log out the result. Fine, that's gonna work. Uh, we'll see it if we save this. We'll see it over here in the browser. There's R3. Uh, and then as we just saw, now we can uh, kind of name these as variables. So add equals, and then we have this new syntax for arrow functions. 
And uh, works basically the same here. And then also, as we saw, we do have the ability to have this implicit return where we can kind of get rid of the, the uh, definition there and then just have parentheses for what we want to actually return. This is going to do the exact same thing and it works. So in my experience, arrow functions are more concise. You can, uh, you can compact them down depending on the type of return value, et cetera, that you have. I just kind of like the way they're defined and then they have implications in this that are important to know. So we'll actually talk about the next, but I write almost all of my functions as arrow functions. That's what I've gotten used to. That's what I see other people do more and more. So if you're not using arrow functions, that's okay, but maybe it's time to look into the use of arrow functions and see if it can help clean up a little bit of your code and see if you can get used to implementing that into your JavaScript workflow. Now, with that said, there are implications, as I mentioned, with the uh, this in JavaScript, which leads me to the next one, which is the fact that I don't reference this anymore. Uh, this is historically one of the most difficult and challenging topics in JavaScript is understanding what in the world this is and the scoping and all the things that go along with it. Uh, so I actually don't work with this almost at all anymore, to be quite honest. So here's an example of arrow functions, uh, how they affect the this keyword inside of an arrow function, and then how you can get away from using this uh, in general. So uh, I've got a button on this HTML page. When it gets clicked, it's gonna call this function, and then we're gonna log out this. So on this page, we will uh, do click me. You can see that the this is referring to the actual button itself. That actually makes sense. That's actually pretty nice. And what happens if we get down and do an arrow function? So we change it like this where we have our arrow. Everything else is the same, but now this is going to refer to something else. In this case, it's going to refer to uh, the window. So it doesn't take that inherent uh, binding to the actual element that we're targeting here. Now that is a little bit of a disadvantage if you're looking to reference this pun not intended button directly inside of here. The other thing that you can do is you can take the uh, E, the event, and you can log this out, and then you'll have the event.target uh, as one of those properties to actually grab that element as well. So there's target down there. And if we say E.target, we can then uh, see specifically that this is going to uh, grab that button just like we had referenced before. So we have to do slightly more work and the context of this inside of here is changed but avoiding this almost altogether is kind of nice. I'm not saying you shouldn't understand how this works in JavaScript, but if you don't have to think about it, why would you? So I see less and less of people using this in their code, and I use this less and less. So I see less of this, again, no pun intended. And uh, in this case, I would use arrow functions and then reference that target if I need, needed to. Oftentimes I'll have like an array of buttons. Um, so if I had, let's just imagine this was an array of buttons. And let's say we combine some of our previous knowledge with for each and we got a reference to each button. And then inside of here, we called, let's see if I can make this work syntactically. Button dot, does that work? I think that works. So let's say we were iterating through each one of these and setting the click handler, another thing that we would have access to just based on scoping is this individual button later on. So if we uh, say no caps, if we log out this button, uh, you'll see that it'll still have, based on enclosures, still have a reference to this. Uh, so we can just say, instead of buttons, we'll just say this is gonna be array with button in it. And this should still work the exact same where we have our button logged out here. So that's something that I often end up doing is having an array of DOM elements or buttons, adding the event listener, then I still have through closers access to that variable so I can reference it directly. All of that I think comes down to preference, but I use arrow functions for everything and then I, uh, I don't use this very often. Now the next one is the use of var. Uh, so var has kind of since been uh, really been left in the past for the use of constant let. Notice that I've used const all the time above here. And I think the biggest downside is a little bit of confusion around scoping for uh, var. So if we look at this, I have this for loop and inside of here, I create this variable test and then I try to log it out after. And it would look like that I wouldn't have access to this variable uh, based on the scoping fences, these brackets being the fences and kind of maintaining that scope. But if we look at this, it's actually going to uh, log out something, which is that test variable. The difference is if I do const here, 
uh, then I try to log it out, it's going to come back as uh, not defined. And that's because const is going to respect these boundaries of these brackets and not be accessible outside of this. Now, I think that makes much more sense to me. And then we have the ability to differentiate between const and let, const being something I think you, like in theory, you'll get a little bit of protection from of not being able to change that thing. Uh, let is something that you would then be able to change. So constant let versus var. I almost never see var in documentation anymore. And if I do, it's a little bit, not necessarily a red flag, but it's it makes me think that that code hasn't, or that documentation hasn't been updated. So almost always going forward, you will probably see constant let instead of var. All right, another one uh, that people said is that they have stopped commenting their code and instead they write self-documenting code. I think the idea of self-documenting code is like pretty meta and it's it's hard to really have that be something tangible. Um, but the concept kind of makes sense to me. And here's an example. If I had uh, what is an object of profile. So let's say I had a thousand profiles. I wanted to prefix them with the first name. This way I could do constant lookups, go look up how uh, objects work versus arrays. If this were an array of these objects, I'd have to search through each one comparing the first name property to then grab the one that I'm looking for. Or maybe this is actually better yet, probably like a one, two, three, an ID to a profile. So like a student ID or something. So profiles doesn't really give you a lot of insights into what this object is. So my one version of self-documenting code is to change this to be something like ID to profile or ID to user. Let's do that. ID to user uh, map. So let's use that as the variable. And uh, we don't really need to do anything else with this other than just so the impact that this name has. So this is now showing me that this object uh, is a map. Map is uh, basically what JavaScript or JavaScript objects are basically maps behind the scenes, just the idea of key value pairs. And then it's also explicitly telling us what the key and the value are. So we've got an ID that maps to an object in here, which represents the user. So by naming this thing a little bit longer of a name, but a more specific name, I don't have to add as much commenting documentation around the fact that this is an ID to user map. It's right there in the name. So I always prefer longer, more specific names over shorter, less specific names. And I think this helps influence the ability to write less comments and have more meta self-documenting code. All right, uh, moving down from there is the concept of manually checking to see if properties exist. And this is using uh, optional chaining. So if I wanted to uh, log out the first name, let's take an example here of, and I think I've changed this. So let's do uh, not profiles. This example I've changed on myself. So ID to user map. And we'll say ID of one, which doesn't exist, and we call first name. Well, what do we get? In this case, we're going to get uh, an error that says we're trying to read the first name property of undefined. Since this thing is undefined, it doesn't actually exist. Now, optional chaining in here comes in and says like, hey, we can safely do this by adding in this question mark. And now you'll see we get undefined, but we don't get an error. So the optional chaining here is adding this question mark to say only try to access this property if this thing actually exists. Now, what people have stopped doing, that's what they started doing. What they've stopped doing is doing stuff like this and saying, if not ID to user map of one, uh, you could say uh, user doesn't exist. And then you could uh, just return that to break out of that uh, statement. Uh, I, I'm not inside of a function, so I can't do that. Uh, so maybe I would do something like this. So move this console log up here and then get rid of the question mark. So what this is saying is uh, we're doing a manual check here to see if that exists. So now we get this message that says user doesn't exist. Otherwise, we actually access it. So if we do this, one, two, three, then that should actually log out the first name. But obviously, it's much simpler to get rid of all of this and uh, use the optional chaining with the question mark. And then we grab the value or we get undefined if this first part doesn't exist. Cool thing is you can continue to um, to chain these on, where if you wanted to do a substring of this to get the first two letters, you can do that. So you can chain these things on infinitely and go down and down and down your, uh, your chain and optionally chain them together to see if those things exist. So question marks here uh, make code a lot cleaner and are pretty, uh, pretty nice to use.
All right, the uh, one of the last things, we've got two more, is uh, doing manual uh, compatibility for browsers. Now, one example of this, and there's tons of different tools, is the idea of the auto prefixer tool. So what this will take is you give it some CN CSS, and a lot of frameworks have this built in, so you don't even have to worry about it. Uh, but it takes these and it looks at what are what are some of these uh, properties in CSS that are different between browsers, and then it translate that translates that to the browser specific versions of these. You can see there's WebKit versions here uh, for uh, user select. There's the Moz MS. I guess is I don't know if that's Internet Explorer. I don't even know because I don't use these myself anymore, uh, to be honest. So. There's tools in here that take care of almost all this stuff. There's also uh, feature queries in CSS to see if something does exist. And so in that case, you're not targeting a specific browser, you're targeting whatever browser you're on and its functionality or what it supports. So if it doesn't support something, you can have a fallback, et cetera. But you're not really doing browser compatibility stuff directly as much. You're letting the tools take care of that for you. And that I think we can all agree has, has made web development a lot easier. The browsers are now more standardized than they were before, uh, but it's much easier to have the tools take care of this for you than to go and manually uh, write all the different uh, you know, versions of the CSS properties with prefixes that you'd have to. That's something I never want to do. And it's just not very fun. So take care of, so take advantage of your tools to do browser compatibility. Now, the last thing we'll do is just kind of mention the idea of debugging. And so a lot of people said they no longer do 100% of debugging with console.log. I challenge that because I still do a lot of mine and I have videos on debugging. I still do a lot of mine with console.log, but actual debugging is pretty amazing. So an example of this, if we go back to this uh, button handler, let's go ahead and add this button handler code back in. And then I can add a, um, uh, what is it called? A breakpoint here. And then we can do a debugging session. So we can run and debug this. We can run it in Chrome. And uh, we're gonna run this against port 5500. All right, so that's what uh, that's where it's running. So we're gonna go ahead and run this. It's gonna open up a browser. I think, there we go. Uh, we have our click me here. When we click this, it should now go back to uh, VS Code. It should hit that breakpoint. I can do all the things that I could do in debugging. I've got a video on that you can check out if you want to. Uh, but doing this is, definitively in a lot of cases much better and much more powerful than just doing console log statements. So take advantage of the debugging tools that you have. VS Code has some really awesome ones built right into it, so you can go and do it there. Again, video on that if you wanna check it out. Uh, but don't rely solely on console.log, even if it is super useful, take advantage of the tools that you have at your disposal. So those are 10 different things that JavaScript developers have stopped doing. I would love to hear your opinions on if these are things that you stopped doing, if not, I'd love to hear your reason as to why you're continuing to do some of the things that we mentioned on here that other developers have stopped doing. No judgment, just kind of curious what your preferences are. So let me know in the comments below. Thanks as always for checking out the video and I'll catch you next time.